With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Back to Sunday School 2. Now I must confess at the outset there are a couple of reasons I really don't like my own sermon title. It's not very catchy. Doesn't seem that original. I prefer a good sermon title that that grabs the heart and the focus and the attention of those in the congregation. I came across a list of some sermon titles that would meet that kind of description. For example, there was one preacher who was preaching about the prodigal son, how he came to himself in the pig pen and said that he was perishing with hunger while his father's servants had bread and enough to spare. In preaching from Luke 15, the preacher titled his sermon, Better a Fat Servant Than a Skinny Corpse. Preaching on the Gathering Demoniac, the sermon was called A Nude Dude in a Rude Mood. Preaching on church attendance, one preacher called his an address to submarine Christians, those who rarely surface. Preaching on the sin of adultery, one pastor labeled his message, you can't have your Kate and your Edith too. (laughs) Preaching on the legion of demons that were cast into the herd of swine, the preacher called his sermon, when Jesus made deviled ham. And preaching on Ehud the judge killing Eglon the king, I mentioned to you somewhat recently the preacher who called his message when Lefty stuck it to Fatty. Now the other reason that I really don't like this title is because I usually don't like sequels. The the, the second and the third one are usually not that good. Say Rocky Balboa goes right there. Other than Star Wars and perhaps the Indiana Jones movies, the sequel is usually a disappointment. When I was a boy, Jaws made us want to never go to the beach again. Jaws 2 made us want to never go to the movies again. But the title is set before us nonetheless, Back to Sunday School 2. The context of Exodus 18 is fairly simple. We're in the early days of the exodus of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage. We're just a few chapters past the night of the Passover, just a few chapters past the parting of the Red Sea. There's already been the miraculous gift of sustenance and provision from the hand of God. There has been the original uh, striking of the rock and water has flowed from the rock. Israel has embarked on a battle against King Amalek and all of his people. That's the well-loved story where uh, Aaron and Hur held up the arms of Moses that Israel may be successful in the battle. So we are in the early days of the freedom from the bondage of Egypt. And in those early days of Israel being its own nation, being out from under the leadership and the, and the dictatorial thumb of Pharaoh, Moses' father-in-law comes out to meet him. It seems that when Moses went to do his prophetic ministry down in Egypt, that he left his wife and his children at home. And so as they've been staying with her father, Moses now brings, or, or Jethro now brings Moses' wife and the children out to the wilderness to meet up with Brother Moses. And Jethro encounters something when he gets there that really makes him scratch his head. He sees that Moses, the leader of no doubt tens of thousands, some would say hundreds of thousands of Jewish people, Moses is attending to every single individual need. And Jethro simply says, what is this you're doing? Why are you standing there dealing with the minute details and disputes of the people from sun up till sundown, from what we would say from can till can't? And Moses said, well, what am I supposed to do? The people are coming to me with all their disputes, and I, I'm, I'm the one that takes their disputes to God, and, and then I get a word from God consistent with the statutes of His Word. I, I, I get the, the problems of the people, I take them to God, and then I get the Word of God, and I bring them back to the people. What else am I to do? That sounds like a pretty good job to have, doesn't it, for a man that would be a prophet of the people of God? These folks trust me. They bring their burdens and their troubles, their cares and their disputes. They bring them to me because they want to know what God has to say on the matter. And then they stand around and wait on me to tell them what thus saith the Lord. What in heaven's name could be wrong with that? 
But the Bible records here very succinctly the words of the father-in-law. What you're doing is not good. Now in any individual case, Moses may have done a very good thing. It's not that he wasn't doing a good thing by carrying the needs of the people to God. It's not that he wasn't doing a good thing by bringing the word of God back to the people. He was not doing a good thing because he was trying to do it all on his own. The congregation of the nation of Israel needed to be broken down into smaller units. And other God-called leaders who God had already positioned and engrafted into the nation. They were out there. They were just not being properly utilized. So Moses was doing a lot of stuff he should not have been doing. And because of that, there were a lot of people who should have been doing some some work themselves. They were not doing what they ought to have been doing. Moses was doing what he should not have been doing. And the whole thing, according to the Word of God, was not good. Now, I believe the Spirit of God moves on the heart of Jethro to give Moses this advice. In fact, Jethro says, I'm going to give you some advice, and if God be with you, If God be pleased, in other words, Moses, you take this to the Lord, and if you sense an ounce of God on the counsel that I'm giving you, you put this into place, and it'll be better for you and better for all the people. Well, what was the advice? The advice could be broken down into one simple little word, delegation. You need to bring some other leaders around you to divide this task and the minutia, the mundane, the ordinary, daily disputes of life, The simple questions, the ones that that anyone that can hear from God can answer. You need to let some people come and help you in bearing this ministry load. Now from Exodus 18 and this encounter between Moses and Jethro, I just want to give you three simple principles tonight. And I hope that you can see how these can be implemented through the ministry tool that we call Sunday School. First of all, and I do not mean this to sound self-serving at all tonight... But this text speaks about the priorities for the minister. Now again, I want to hasten to say that I'm not trying to address anything in the life of this church. If anything, I want to say, God bless you. Thank you for coming alongside the the paid staff and the deacons of this church for doing your part and pulling your portion of the ministerial load. But nonetheless, there are some principles here that speak of the right priorities for the minister. Adrian Rogers once said that the pastor who is always available is not worth much when he is. Think about that. As Israel begins its life as a free people, they are experiencing growth pains, and those pains are manifesting in Moses' life. He is on the verge very early in this Exodus journey of what we today would call burnout. And God in His great grace sends some organizational wisdom through His father-in-law. And as I mentioned, it could be wrapped up in the word delegation. Now the advice that Moses receives speaks of the priorities of the minister. Now tonight I could report to you statistically that the average Southern Baptist church has a little over 100 members. They have about 75 or so of those that we would deem as more or less active. And probably 45 to 50 would be a good crowd on a typical Sunday morning. And the primary reason for that is this. By that I mean the primary reason that the average Southern Baptist church tonight would have fewer people than those seated in one little section of our sanctuary tonight is really quite simple. It's really a fact of human organizational nature. That's about the largest congregation that one man can personally attend to. In his book, Breaking the Growth Barriers, the author of that book studied the the growth barriers in churches and in Sunday schools, those barriers that prevent churches and ministries from reaching more and more people. And the author notes that somewhere around the number of 100 to no more than about 115 to 120, the barrier that hinders most churches' ministry is the mindset that the pastor must do all of the ministry alone. And once again, I must hasten to say, I thank God on behalf of my own life, my own peace, 
and the benefit and blessing to my family and to our staff and our staff families. Thank you, Emmanuel Baptist. Thank you, Personnel Committee. Thank you, Deacon Ministry. Thank you, church family, for not having a mindset that the the minister, in this case the pastor, must do all the ministry. Now, in many of these congregations that have that narrow mindset, I will hear church members actually brag on their pastor in ways like this. Our pastor is at everything. Our pastor never misses anything. He's at all of my kids' games. He's at all of the piano recitals. He's at all of the school plays. Oh, how we love our pastor. He's at everything. Well, I don't mean to offend you, but I don't call that a pastor. I call that a stalker. (laughs) And Jethro says, I believe led by the Holy Ghost of God, that's actually not a good thing. And in this text, he reveals the priorities for the minister. They are threefold. First of all, there's praying. Verse 19, he said, listen to me, I'll give you counsel. God be with you. You be the people's representative before God and bring the disputes to God. Near the end of his life, the great evangelist Billy Graham was asked, if you could go back and do your ministry over again, is there anything that you would change? And without hesitation, the great Baptist evangelist said he would pray more. How convicting for most of us whose knees are soft and whose prayer closets are full of junk. We'd, most of us, if we're honest, we'd have to clean some stuff out of a prayer closet if it were a literal closet before we could spend time in prayer. The advice that Jethro gives is a reminder to us that the successful pastor spends more time talking to God about the people than he spends talking to the people about God. He says, there's a priority you ought to have, Moses. You need to spend time taking the needs, the cares, the burdens of the people into the presence of God. Just this morning, I was approached by a church member who had such a burdensome prayer request, he could barely get it out of his mouth. And I was honored before God to pray for him in that moment and to call his name before heaven again this afternoon. And in my spirit right now, I'm even praying for him and interceding on his behalf. The prophet said, God forbid that I should sin against God by ceasing to pray for you. The most important thing that I can do for you as your preacher, one of my priorities is to take your burdens to God in prayer. By the way, you don't need me to do that because you can do that yourself. But what a privilege it is for me to join heart and hand and to lift my voice, taking your needs to the very throne room of God. One of the application points here is the minister's priority is for him to be right with God himself. The greatest thing that I can do for you as your pastor is to walk with God myself and to spend time to be a man of prayer. So the priorities for the minister include, first of all, praying. But then in verse 20, there's a reference to preaching. After you take the needs to the people, to God, verse 20, then teach them the statutes and the laws. Make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. I I would consider that the preaching that I tend to do is what I would call preventative counseling. Pastor, in a church of our size, how can you be available to meet the counseling needs of all the congregation? I do it every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, 10.30. I do it again at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights. And if you would come and listen to the biblical counsel that the pastor gives to you, you would have to come by a lot during the week, although when you need to come by during the week, I am grateful to provide that ministry. All across this campus, there are men and as appropriate women who take the Word of God and give preventative counsel to tell you how to stay out of a lot of the trouble that God's people tend to find themselves in. Here, Jethro says, Moses, you've got some priorities. Those include praying And they include preaching. Now, for me personally, I spend about an average of 
of around 10 hours every sermon, often more. And I've got enough sense to know that if something were to happen to me tonight, there's going to be at least one person in this church, there'll be at least one, that's going to find the arm of a deacon, going to find the ear of a pulpit committee member, and it'll sound something like this. Listen to me now. We've had a preacher. We need a pastor. What that really means is we've had somebody that could fill the pulpit. We need a chaplain because I had my ingrown toenail removed and he wasn't there to hold my hand and anoint it with Crisco. (laughs) Now look right here and listen to me. If I drop dead tonight, Get you somebody who can preach. Hire you a chaplain if you need a chaplain. You don't need a chaplain trying to stand up here and preach the Word of God to you Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. You head down that road and you will regret it as you move your membership to another church in the community where the man knows how to rear back and preach. He says, you've got some priorities, Moses. Praying. Preaching. Then there's planning. Planning. Teach them, verse 20 says, the way in which they are to walk and the work. Look at this now. And the work that they are to do. Moses, your job is to pray and preach and plan for the work that the people are to do. Now, in the pages of the New Testament, one of the words that is used to describe the office of of the pastor is the word overseer. It's the Greek word episkopos, from which our Episcopalian friends get the name of their denominational movement. It literally means an overseer. And one Bible translation in 1 Timothy 3 renders it like this, that if any man desires the office of an overseer, an episcope, an episkopos, it is a noble job that he desires. That word episkopos Translated overseer could also be rendered as supervisor. It speaks of one who looks over the work and watches over the work that others are doing. And now we don't think a lot these days about supervisors. You heard about the Department of Transportation that recently laid off 5,000 workers when they realized a shovel could stand up on its own. I'm talking about the work they are to do. Now, one of the biblical roles of a pastor is recorded in Ephesians 4, verse 12. That is to equip the saints for the working of the ministry to the building up of the body of Christ. One successful businessman who used to live in our community, who owned a number of restaurants, said to me one day that you don't pay a manager for the work that he does. You pay the manager for the work that he can get other people to do. Now, to be clear, a good pastor will never ask you to do anything that he himself is not at least willing to do. And depending on what that task is, he may, in fact, not be just the supervisor, but also a co-laborer to join heart and hand and work that task with you. But the bottom line is he's not the one doing all of the work. This principle is repeated in the pages of the New Testament, Acts 6, verses 1 and 2, Brother Josh preached a tremendous message from this passage just a few months ago. There the Bible says, the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, select from among you seven men of good reputation." full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Note this, the apostle said, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So the advice that Moses received from Jethro involves some advice about the priorities for the minister. But secondly, there's some advice here about the plan for the ministry. Moses, you need to break the congregation down into more manageable units. And you need to put some of your best men in charge of thousands. And you need to put some people under that that are in charge of hundreds. And put some people under that that are in charge of fifties and even of 
tens. Now the plan for ministry that he gives sounds an awful lot like what we call Sunday school. And as I shared with you this morning, Sunday school is not an organization of the church. Sunday school is the church organized to fulfill the Great Commission. And if you were to ask me tonight, is Sunday school a perfect plan? Probably not. Could other plans work? Absolutely. God was fulfilling His gracious commission long before anything that we would call Sunday school ever came along. But I just say to you lovingly as your pastor, since this plan has worked for us in the past, since this plan is now working, and since this plan will work, and since it's the plan your church leadership is putting forward, I believe this is the plan to fulfill the Great Commission here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Now, there are three reasons that I say that, and we find them in verses 21 through 23. We're just working our way back through the text. First of all, I believe it is more scriptural. For in verse 21, the Bible says, Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men, men who have been given ability by God. Now, in this case, they're providing both spiritual and governmental leadership over the people. So God has raised up God-called men. Certainly in the case of our young girls' classes, our children's ministry, our youth girls, and our women's classes, we would apply this principle to God-called, God-enabled women as well. But in this word of instruction, he says, Moses, one reason what you're doing is not good There are some other able people in the assembly. And the reason you're getting burnt out, you're doing their job. And while you're doing their job, guess what they're not doing? You're doing what they ought to be doing, and that means they're not doing what they ought to be doing. You ought to jot down a reference to 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 was a memory verse for us a few years ago. For to each one has been given a manifestation of the Spirit for the profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, for the good or for the benefit, for the profit of all. Moses, there are some other people who have been gifted and enabled by God to, in our context, in our vernacular, to look into the Word of God, to get along with God, to listen to the problem that person is facing, and to just open up and exegete the Word of God and teach the people what thus saith the Lord. Moses, you're not the only one in the congregation who knows how to teach the Word of God. Simply put, in our context, if everyone just came and listened to the pastor, not only would you get bored with listening to me week in and week out, But there are other people who the Spirit of God has implanted into the body of Christ at Emmanuel Baptist. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that he has given some as pastors and teachers. And if all we do is come in one large setting and others do not break down the Word of God in small group settings, then there are other people who are not doing what God has called them to do. So I say without apology, this approach is more scriptural. But I kind of give you a very practical word of exhortation. It is more stable. Verse 22. Let them judge the people at all time and let it be that every major dispute they bring to you, every minor dispute they themselves will judge, it will be, boy, this sounds very pragmatic, doesn't it? But I believe it's got God all over it. It will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. Moses, this cannot all depend on you. Moses, this work cannot cannot rest solely on your shoulders. Moses, you're going to get burnt out and the people are going to get put out. And it's not going to be good for you. And it's not going to be good for them. By the way, this is one reason why we birth new units when classes get larger. I'm grateful for Brother Richard and our Sunday school teachers meeting before this service tonight, he pointed out that when classes get larger and overcrowded, we never split a class. We never bust up a class. You split wood. You bust up wood. 
But when it comes to Sunday school classes, we create new units. We birth new Sunday school classes. It should be a time of great joy, excitement, and enthusiasm. And very practically, that's more stable for the life of a congregation. Now, you may not think this way. You don't have to think this way as a church member. But being called by God to shepherd this congregation, I must prayerfully think this way. When you see one person in a church that say, say they run 300 in Sunday school and one dynamic teacher has 80 or 85 people in his class, you have a recipe for a church split. You've got a recipe for a problem. You, you've got a recipe for instability in that congregation. So when the workload is divided, when it's shared by more people, it's not only more scriptural, it's more stable. Now as I look at this and examine my own life and my own ministry, I want you to listen very carefully to the heart of your pastor tonight. Later this year, I'll be 52 years old by God's grace. I recognize that makes me older than some and obviously younger than others. I pray that God would give me length of life and that He would grace me to let me spend the balance of my ministry as your pastor. But the day is going to come that I will no longer be your pastor. Whether that's by my untimely death, whether that's by the providence of God, or if God calls me and allows me to do what vocationally we would call retire. I never plan to retire from ministry in the Lord's service, but I may find myself one day physically unable to, to perform day in and day out the rigors of pastoring this church. I am not announcing my retirement tonight. <laughs> I am announcing that if I live long enough, the day will come that I will have to announce my retirement and I'm already beginning to have to think at least occasionally in that direction. We may not be 10, 12 years from now that I have to share that news with you in a Sunday morning or a Sunday night service. And what I mean is we cannot wait as a congregation to position ourselves organizationally and ministerially where everything cannot revolve around one man standing in the pulpit, a church that is built around any one man except the God-man Jesus Christ is a church that is as unstable as spilled water. And when churches go through times of transition, you see, if I, if I have a ministry like the one I described, that means I may retire with 40 or 45 years as your pastor. And do you know what happens in most churches where a pastor is called in to follow a guy who's been there 40 or 45 years? They go into the tank because it's all been built around one personality. May God give us a commitment to small group ministry where we pour our lives into one another. And listen to me, that, in that case, the pastor can come and the pastor can go because pastors will eventually come and they will eventually go. But the church will be built on the firm foundation of Christ and Christ alone. The, 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 this plan for the ministry is more scriptural. It's more stable and because of that it will be verse 23 more successful verse 23 if you do this thing now and if God so commands in other words he said Moses if you get along with God and God doesn't seem to be on this advice you don't have to take it you go with God but if you take this counsel into the presence of God and God so commands you verse 23 then you'll be able to endure and the people will be able to go to their place in peace Moses, it'll be better for you as the pastor, if you will, and it will be better for the people. Things will go a whole lot more smoothly, more successfully. Now, if you think about it, expansion is never seen as negative anywhere except in the Lord's church. And often it is seen negatively by the people in the Lord's church. I, I mean, when a business expands to a second location... We hit like on Facebook. We comment, congratulations. Way to go. God is blessing. 
proud of you. Great job. But when it comes to expansion in the Lord's church, some of the best Christians I know start saying, well, now, preacher, I just hope we don't get so consumed with numbers and only concerned about growing. Pastor, I'm afraid we're going to get so big, we're going to lose our friendliness. Folks, if we're not concerned about reaching more people, we've already lost our friendliness. It'll be more successful. So in this advice that Jethro gives to Moses, we read of the priorities for the minister. The plan for the ministry. Thirdly, we read about the perspective from the members. You see, this plan will not work unless it is embraced by the members of the congregation. Had the Jews revolted and said, I don't care what your pa-in-law told you, I'm going to see Moses. It doesn't matter to me if Joshua came by, Moses didn't come by and I'm ticked off. No, this perspective had to be embraced by the membership. Now we see in verses 24 through 27 very quickly that first they had a serving spirit. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that that he had said and he chose these able men and made them heads over the people of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties and of tens. Verse 26, they judged the people at all times. They had a serving spirit. I know this is not rocket science tonight, but the best plan won't work if we won't. The best ministry plan won't work if we won't work. Now, no doubt someone in this room tonight or listening to this message later is not on board with focusing so much on the Sunday school ministry because at some point in the past, Sunday school did not work for you. For whatever reason, you were involved in a class and it didn't meet your needs, scratch your itch, float your boat, or ring your bell. Maybe you went regularly, but your ministry needs still fell through the cracks. I just want to stop by again and remind you of something I said this morning. Any ministry that you want to set up alongside the Sunday school to say, we don't need to do that through the Sunday school. We, we need a parallel ministry over here to accomplish something else for the Great Commission. Anything that you would set up beside the Sunday school could be done through the Sunday school ministry if we would but do it. I've shared with our staff recently that in the early days of my pastorate, a man, he and his family no longer live in Blackshear. They left our community about a year or so after the story I'm about to share with you. He was a teacher of one of our younger couples classes, and it was re-enlistment time, reorganization time, you know, where department directors are invigorating the prayer life of the congregation because people will say, I'll have to get back to you. I'm going to have to pray about that. I have to pray about teaching that class again next year. And the prayer life of the congregation gets put on steroids around this time of the year. But this man came to me and he said, I I I wanted you to hear this from me. I'm not going to be teaching that young couples class again next year. Well, it really didn't break my heart too much because he was not really applying himself to that class. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just telling you the, the, the truth about this story. And I said, well, what is it that God has called you to do? Because I don't believe God has ever called you to go from doing something to doing nothing. Now, there's a sermon right there. God may have called you to go from doing something to doing something else. But he's never called you to go from doing something to doing nothing. Be very cautious when you start to give up a ministry role in the church that you don't sense the call of God to go from doing something to doing nothing because that is not the call of God. That is as demonic as a devil in hell itself. But, but, so, so I asked him, well, what is it that God has called you to do? He said, well, we really have a burden for these young couples. We're going to start a Tuesday night Bible study in our subdivision. I said, oh? He said, yes. We really care about these young couples, and we want to see them raise their children to 
to know God and understand the Bible and we're going to reach out to the young couples in our community that that don't even go to church anywhere and invite them over to the Tuesday night Bible study. And, and if they've got a need in their life, we're going to minister to it. You know, maybe get the people that do come to the Tuesday night Bible study to put supper together and take it over to their house. And, and before long, I had to interrupt them. And I said, brother, and I'm trying not to use his first name, but I said, brother, do you realize you've just described an effective Sunday school class? He said, well, that doesn't sound like my class at all. I said, you didn't hear what I said. You just described an effective Sunday school class. And I did not say that to be harsh. And I don't repeat it tonight to be rude. But I simply asked this man, what is it you plan on doing differently on Tuesday night that you're not doing on Sunday morning for your class because the same thing that is hindering the effectiveness on Sunday morning will just be transplanted to a different hour of the week. But if you would pour what you're planning on doing on Tuesday night into your Sunday morning Sunday school class, let me tell you what else we'll be able to do. When they bring their kids, there's a place for them to go to. There's a a church for them to be connected to because the whole class is is a part of of a congregation. I'm talking about having a servant's heart. And a serving spirit. The people embraced what Moses put before them. And may God bless this congregation for the way that you embrace this ministry model as well. There's a serving spirit. It also involves, secondly, a sacrificial spirit. Verse 26, they judge the people. These unnamed judges, they judge the people at all times. Times I have in my notes this simple little point. They didn't all get to see Moses. They had to give some things up. Fox's book of martyrs is a tremendous book that you ought to add to your library. You can buy it in written, printed form. You can download it for your favorite e-reader. Fox's book of martyrs. It chronicles the story of men and women who have been martyred for the faith down through the years. And one of the most poignant stories to me in Fox's book of martyrs is the story of a woman who would not cease sharing the gospel of Christ. It was in a day and in a place where that was not allowed by law. And I don't mean to be grotesque tonight. But as they burned her at the stake, she would not stop proclaiming the gospel of our Lord. And so her murderers took a screw. And what in our case would be a large washer. And they put that screw through the washer and drove it through her tongue and fastened her tongue to her jawbone so that she would die in silence. Her children who came to take her ashen remains removed that screw from her skeletal remains. I say that just to say how convicted we as the people of God, my hand lifted first, that we would ever feel that we have sacrificed much for the cause of Christ. This will really become a factor this fall When we reorganize our Sunday school ministry, it will be the first church-wide Sunday school reorganization that we've had in a number of years because of the COVID-19 global pandemic. In our day, we think that we have sacrificed because we've been asked to move from Mr. Jones's class meeting in room one to Mr. Smith's class meeting in room two because we think that Mr. Jones is a better teacher than Mr. Smith, and indeed he may be. But what in God's name does that have to do with us? Being willing to sacrifice for the cause of Christ. No doubt Moses was the greatest and most powerful teacher in all the nation of Israel. He was indeed a prophet of God. So much so that he appeared with the prophet Elijah at the mountain of transfiguration. And his 
ministry in the life of Israel was so great that when he appeared in that visionary form, no less than Simon Peter said, let's build three tabernacles, one of which would be to this man, Moses. But the people were willing to sacrifice. As I left my office right before this service, my attention as I came out the door came on that little sign I've told you about, where's the cross? Where in a message on Jethro and Moses and Emmanuel Baptist in Sunday school, where would be a picture of the cross? Here it is. God, after all you've done for me at Calvary's cross, lay down your life that I could be forgiven of my sin, have the blessed hope of eternal life in heaven when I die. The very least that I could do for you is to sacrifice anything and everything you've called me to do so that others can come to know the good gospel of grace. Now, what was the perspective of the members in Israel? They had a sacrificial spirit. They had a serving spirit. Finally, they had a submissive spirit. Verse 26 continues, the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses But every minor dispute they themselves would judge. And Moses told his father-in-law goodbye. And Jethro went on his way into his own land. By their actions, they simply said, If that's how God has spoken to the leadership of our people, we will do what God has said to do. In conclusion tonight, if we will have the right priorities, the right plan, and yes, the right perspective. I believe Emmanuel Baptist Church can continue a wonderful ministry of reaching the lost, discipling the saved, and ministering to our people as we get back to Sunday school. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.